then we're going to be talking about wearables, but we're going to start talking about free diving. We're going into the ocean instead of outer space. So this topic is coming out of Carnegie Mellon University. Now, um, as always, with any topic that we talk about uh, on this show, I did not know that free divers literally hold their breath for the entire diving duration. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, so like explain free divers to me like I don't know what's going on. Explain it to me like I'm five okay. years old. So imagine this like superhuman that takes one breath and then they start going down in the in the ocean for like a hundred meters. Okay. And then they come back out with that single breath. They don't have a tank, they don't have anything on them. It's literally just them themselves. So it's like me when I'm swimming at the pool, I hold my breath and I try to go like swim down and touch the bottom. Yeah. They do that. And you know, like you hold your breath for like a minute. Yeah. You're like, oh, this really sucks. They, yeah. Imagine someone doing that and like very, very deep where there's a lot of pressure for like six, seven minutes. Okay. So they hold their breath for like way longer than I can. They swim like as deep as like a skyscraper that's 30 stories tall and yes. they don't have any extra equipment that's attached to them. Yes. So if that sounds scary to you, it's because it really yeah. is scary. Now, what tends to happen in some instances is um, as you're going down, as the diver's going down, the amount of oxygen in their blood and their brain is actually holding pretty steady. But as they're coming back out, when they're, you know, using their legs to pump themselves up, that's when they start using up a lot of that oxygen. And in some instances, they black out due to lack of oxygen. And if they do, they need someone up there, their fellow divers, to come back and rescue okay, them. Okay, so... Right. They're really well trained to like conserve their energy, conserve their oxygen. They go down, they swim around, they do whatever they're wanting to. They go as deep as they can. But then when they're coming up, they're like, their body's telling them, man, I need air. And then they start burning a bunch of extra oxygen because they're kicking as fast as they can to get to the mm -hmm. surface. That's like that. That's their main failure mode, right? They, they pass out right near the surface because they need air. Exactly. Right near the surface, the last couple meters is apparently the most critical part. Because okay. like your body's like... I am very, very low. We really need some oxygen. Please help. Okay. So this is kind of where the problem lies, right? Like what if someone starts running out of oxygen too early and you can't really see them? How do you tell if they've blacked out or they need help? Right now you can't, right? So you can't put an Apple watch on them because if you're down 100 meters, your wearable is not going to work. Okay, yeah. Like diver's watches are very specially designed to handle that pressure. Most of our exactly. wearable technology does not handle that. So. I'm guessing these folks from Carnegie Mellon made like a super indestructible wearable to measure how these people are doing. Basically, yeah. So let's talk about their secret sauce, as you like to call it. Um, their secret sauce actually isn't that secret. It's near-infrared spectroscopy. And we're, we don't need to get too into the weeds of it, but this technology has already been used in clinics by doctors to understand the activity of your brain, right? What has happened over the past couple of years is that Technology has gotten better. Material science has gotten better. Electronics have gotten better. So now we've been able to miniaturize these devices, which means we can use them in a more natural environment like the deep sea. Right, so near-infrared spectroscopy, I'm assuming it has something to do with infrared light. Can you ex like explain that how that works? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to throw this back to when we took ChemLab. Um, you should probably remember this. We had a spectrometer, and you would put a material in there. There would be some radiation, and there would be light refracted off of it. So you would look into the device, the instrument, and you'd see like red, green, blue, and you could decode that as, oh, this material has like carbon in it or hydrogen okay. in it or whatever. So something similar is happen happening here. They, the, the device that they've constructed has two LEDs that, has, that is operating at two different wavelengths, and they put it on your forehead. Okay. So one of them is monitoring your blood oxygen level, and the other one is doing your brain oxygen okay. level. So it's like so they, those things we used in chemistry to measure what you know, elements are part of any single substance you're looking at. In this case, mm -hmm. the main element they're targeting for is how much oxygen is in the blood and also how much oxygen is saturated in the brain. Exactly. So the clear benefits of this device are very clear, right? Um, you have the divers. You're going to make sure that they're okay because now their friends up top know what their oxygen levels yeah, look like. I mean, like. it's like... So if it starts... They, they've got these people who, for some whatever reason like like to keep swimming after they're running out of air or they go super deep holding their breath where they can't breathe. To me, that's like, I don't know, deciding you're going to drive your car as long as you can after the gas light comes on. And what these folks Which are is doing, a risk that I like to take on pretty often. Uh, yeah, so, so it's relatable for us. But <laughs> yeah. what these folks are doing is like 
adding a very, very accurate range meter on there so they know when they need to go help their friend that ran out of gas. And like, if you run out of gas, it's like, oh, you know, you call AAA. If you <laughs> run out of oxygen, yeah. you could die. Yeah. So it's more critical to make sure that your friends can come and get you when you're dying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so th that is very easy to understand, but there's also another added benefit, which is for cardiovascular patients. So throwing back to what I said originally, these people are superhuman. There's some like magic going on with what they've done to their bodies to handle these extreme, extreme I'm conditions. I'm sure some of it's genetic, but they also probably have to do a ton of training to like condition their bodies mm -hmm. and their minds to be able to handle this. Exactly. So here's what the researchers wanted to do understand how they've conditioned their body, how their body responds to this stimuli. So as they're going down and coming back up, how their pressure changes, they have added sensors that they put on like sea mammals so they can actually layer that data together. And then they want to use that for pre-treatment of cardiovascular surgery patients. So if you're going in for like a heart surgery, they want to make sure they can train your body enough you know, the surgeons and the medical professionals do their best to make sure that you're getting as much oxygen as possible, but it's still a very challenging experience for your body. They're trying to use this data to make sure their patients are in the best spot possible or their body's suited as well as possible for something as extreme as cardiovascular surgery, which I just think is fascinating. Yeah, me too. I you mean, know, we talked like they're looking at like the uh, apex of the human species, physically speaking, like these folks that can hold their breath way longer than anyone else. Under, withstand these like the shock that their body undergoes going through all this pressure and they do it for fun um and they're like taking the source code from those people studying how they do it understanding what's going on and they're trying to copy paste that to people who are like potentially on the complete other end of the spectrum like instead of people that like to drive with their gas light on it's people with a check engine light um <laughs> and like trying to help understand what's going on with these super efficient people that have what seems like superhuman ability and try to help people that are, you know, about to go through a big shock, like open heart surgery or something like that and make sure that they have better chance of survival, better quality of life. And dude, like it's no secret that we love biomimicry on this show. We talk about being inspired from nature and these different species, but this is a clear example of going into our own species and finding out some very like, outlier individuals in terms of their physical performance and being like, how do we make everyone else like that? How do we bring up that performance when it's necessary? And I, I'm just, I'm, I was so fascinated when I was reading this because I thought the main takeaway was going to be we're saving divers, but like, no, this is what we're going to do to address surgeries for one of the biggest issues that we have in society, yeah, period. It's one of the leading causes of Incredible. Death, cardiovascular yeah. disease. And you know, we make this device that is great for helping divers, great for making sure that they're safe so they can keep doing the crazy things that they like to do. And then we're also helping these folks. I mean, a large portion of the population, uh, unfortunately, will have like some type of cardiovascular surgery. So this is, I'm super excited about it. Shout out to these folks at Carnegie Mellon. You know, they never disappoint. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I got to nerd out a little bit yeah, on this. It was, it was a great topic.